Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Gallagher. I'm the director of the Global Development Policy Center here at Boston University, or the GDP Center, as we like to call it. Our mission is to advance policy-oriented research on financial stability, human well-being, and the environment across the world. And one of our signature programs is called the Global China Initiative. And the Global China Initiative does policy-oriented research on the economic, social, and environmental impacts of Chinese overseas development finance. And today's seminar, we're very excited to kick off the year with a seminar called China, Debt, Climate, and Nature, Opportunities for Financial Stability. Last year, we witnessed the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, with Latin America being the hardest hit, both in terms of cases and deaths, uh, with COVID-19 and also in terms of economic contraction. In fact, the region has the, had the worst economic contraction in 120 years. Last year was also tied for the hottest year on record, accentuating the crisis with increases in extreme weather events, drought and associated economic costs. One of the good things about this crisis is that folks have understood that not only do we have to attack the virus and protect the vulnerable and to get our economies going, but there's a real impetus to try to do it in a green and inclusive manner. Advanced economies have been able to respond with over $12 trillion in fiscal stimuli and even more in central bank activities to pump in and backstop financial systems. Even so, the advanced economies still contracted in 2020. Emerging market and developing countries have not been so lucky. Few receiving swap lines from central banks, few having the, the fiscal space to att attack the virus and protect the vulnerable. Uh, to fill this gap, there have been calls throughout the multilateral system for a new allocation of the International Monetary Fund's special drawing rights, its unit of account, almost like printing money, uh, new firepower for the International Monetary Fund and development banks, uh, and new, lend new development lending, all of which happened in the 2008 and 2009 crisis. Uh, in addition, there have been calls for debt relief um, because some countries are experiencing extreme liquidity constraints and another, a number of them are also experiencing insolvency issues. Indeed, the IMF had warned even before 2020 of unsustainable debt levels across the world. Uh, and that only grew with the downturn of 2020. Yet many countries are reportedly spending in between 30 and 70% of their government revenue right now to be able to service external debts with Nigeria being reported at 85% of government revenue. So rather than using fiscal space to attack the virus and protect the vulnerable and mount a green recovery, countries are forced to pay external debts. The multilateral system was strained on these issues to say the least last year with the United States blocking uh, an issuance of special drawing rights and increasing IMF firepower for these issues. However, did uh, the world community did work to mobilize the International Monetary Fund's balance sheet. It has about a trillion dollars available, uh, but only about 388 billion for emerging market and developing countries. I should say the IMF and UNCTAD both estimate that the immediate needs for emerging market and developing countries are about $2.5 trillion. The G20 was able to help provide some help for the poorest countries with something called the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, which delays payments to bilateral creditors now through the mid-2021. Mid and towards the end of 2020, they created something called the Common Framework for DSSI countries, that if countries are insolvent and need restructuring, there's now a mechanism for that for bilateral official creditors. This has proven not to be enough. Last year had more credit downgradings than any uh, financial crisis in recorded history. Six countries already defaulted on their debts with Chad and Ethiopia perhaps uh, on the verge of that right now in 2021. The World Bank estimates that 150 million people were pushed into extreme poverty last year. The election of Joe Biden in the United States has buoyed some hopes for a new multilateralism to attack the virus and protect the vulnerable. And folks are very encouraged by the language that it'll also be used to mount a green recovery. We enter the most important decade in, in history in some levels, where we need to decrease carbon dioxide emissions by 45% by 2030 and to get to net zero by 2050. 
research that the GDP Center did with the Brookings Institution last year, 2019, shows that the world is falling short at 2.2% of GDP to meet those needs to make those transitions. So we can't afford a global debt crisis or a debt overhang over the next decade, the one of the most important in world history. So we're inspired by the executive order that the president called on last week, uh, require, or calling on the treasury to deploy the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank to promote new financing programs, to promote economic stimulus programs around the world, and to engage in significant debt relief that is aligned with the Paris Agreement and our development goals. The GDP Center has produced a lot of research with collaborators over the past year in journals like World Development, Global Policy, and in Policy Reports, uh, where we recommend, in concert with many others around the world, uh, at least three, th core, three core things that need to constitute uh, a multilateral effort to attack the virus, protect the vulnerable, and mount a green recovery. First and foremost is an immediate and large allocation of new special drawing rights at the International Monetary Fund that'll give countries liquidity to be able to pay back international financial institutions and other central banks. Number two is an increase in firepower, both in the International Monetary Fund and in development banks and more concessional and grant financing to ignite these stimulus packages and then align them with our Paris and development goals. And number three is meaningful development de uh, debt relief. With colleagues at the Initiative for Policy Dialogue, SOAS, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, and the former uh, finance minister and central bank he head of Pakistan last year, we called on something called Debt Relief for a Green and Inclusive Recovery uh, that was launched with the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, and former United Kingdom uh, Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. In that proposal, we call for a multilateral global debt relief effort that in, would include and mandate the participation of all creditors, private creditors, international financial institutions, and the bilateral official creditors that are already engaged in some form of debt relief. And that subsequent re recovery and restructuring be aligned with our Paris and climate goals in a number of specific ways. Currently, the G20 efforts uh, are misaligned with, have misaligned incentive to participate uh, and they're misaligned with the Paris and development goals. It should be, it's important to note, especially for today's conversation that we're about to have, that this massive amount of debt in the world economy is about a third of it is in international financial institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, African Development Bank. A third of it is held by private bondholders across the world and commercial banks. And, in the, and the last third or so of it is by bilateral official creditors of which China is the largest. G20 schemes at the moment only include those official bilateral creditors with no significant participation by the private sector or international financial institutions. That creates false incentives. So actors are reluctant to help countries with debt relief because relieved funds aren't necessarily gonna help a country attack the virus and protect the vulnerable. Rather, it'll probably give incentives for countries to be able to take that money and pay back a private bondholder or pay back an international financial institution. Despite that misalignment, China has proven to be the largest and most active participant in these debt relief schemes uh, over 2020, really being the first mover and the leader on this. Today's discussion explores how China could build on that leadership and link debt relief to environmental outcomes that can help trigger a multilateral effort at the G20 and beyond on these issues. In December at the GDP Center, we released something called the China Overseas Development Finance Database, which you can find on our webpage. And we estimate that between 2008 and 2019, China's overseas development finance to, uh, to sovereign nations is upwards around $450 billion. In an article published in Science on Friday, uh, we look at the exposure of that debt and its relation to climate change and biodiversity vulnerabilities. And importantly, look at opportunities for linking some of these debt relief efforts with social and environmental outcomes. And that's what we'll be talking about today. First today, we'll hear from Dr. Rebecca Ray and Dr. Blake Alexander Simmons, two researchers here at the Global Development Policy uh, Center who will give a quick overview of our article that was in science last week and a new interactive database that uh, folks can take a look at. Uh, and then we'll be followed by 
uh, Professor Carlos Larea from the Universidad Andina Simon Bolivar in Ecuador. Uh, he's the architect of the Yasuni initiative in his country and also now has a new proposal for uh, Ecuador to engage in a bilateral uh, debt for climate and nature uh, arrangement with the Chinese. And we'll also hear from Ms. Shuang Lu. Uh, she's a senior researcher at the Sustainable Finance Center at the World Resources Institute, who also has a proposal for uh, China engaging in debt relief efforts that are linked to environmental outcomes. Uh, um, before we hand it over, just uh, some housekeeping. Uh, throughout the, uh, uh, first we'll, we'll hear from these presenters, I'll ask them some questions and then we'll have time for questions and answers. If you look in the bottom right hand corner of your Zoom, there's a little Q&A button. So please feel free throughout this conversation to go into the Q&A button and first and foremost, introduce yourself. There's over a hundred people out there and we'd like to get to know with you and have a global conversation. So tell us your name and your affiliation and then put in your question and I'll field some of those and ask them uh, to the participants as we go on. So let me turn it over now to my colleagues here at the GDP Center, Becky Ray and Blake Simmons. Thanks everyone for coming. Good morning and thank you so much for getting us started, Kevin. Uh, as he mentioned, we sat down to look at uh, how developing countries can hold on to their goals for long-term sustainability and sustainable development given this short-term debt crunch and where can China make the biggest difference in sustainable enhancing, sustainability enhancing debt renegotiations. And our findings are fairly simple. As the world's largest bilateral credit creditor, China has immense potential for relevance here and to support developing countries in these situations. Specifically, we find 41 countries with relatively high exposure to Chinese debt. And of those, 15 have high potential for biodiversity focused negotiations and deals. 25 have high potential for climate change mitigation or adaptation focused deals. And 11 have high potential for both. Next slide, please. Before we get into the details, I'd like to back up for a moment and contextualize this. You'll hear a lot in this presentation about particular mechanisms that can help address this, this breach between sustainable development goals and the short-term debt crisis. You'll hear about debt for nature swaps, debt for climate swaps, sustainability-linked, performance-linked bonds. These are all individual tools, individual mechanisms that can help address this gap, but they sit in an ecosystem that is full of a wide variety of crucial tools. Our goal here is not to advocate for a particular tool or another, but to find literally where in the world do the opportunities and the needs converge to create the greatest potential for movement through one or all of these opportunities for engagement. So alongside the possibility of renegotiating existing debts, which we'll discuss in more detail, sit other options like new conservation finance or linking any new finance to performance uh, targets, um, applying environmental performance standards to any finance existing currently in the portfolio. So getting back into then the details of renegotiating existing debts, can you have the next slide please? Of course these opportunities to make debt more sustainable are the most attractive for countries that are currently facing high exposure to Chinese debts. Obviously that's where the greatest uh, progress towards debt sustainability can be made with debt renegotiation with China. But we can measure that in one of two different ways. First, by looking at the debt stocks, how much money has been committed to these countries in debt. And here we're looking specifically at China's two main policy banks that operate abroad, the China po Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of China because those two banks lend to support policy goals. And that of course is what we are talking about here today is lending and renegotiating debt to in such a way that it supports policy goals. The other way is to think about debt service obligations. What are the debt payments that countries have committed to making in the short term, which can really limit their options for investing in a green recovery. And here we're talking about the DSSI or the Debt Service Suspension Initiative that Kevin mentioned in the introduction, which is a project of the G20 countries in which China is the most active member. So we see these as two potential ways to measure where the possibilities are greatest for debt renegotiation. And you'll see two maps here that measure each of these two ways. The first one is called maximum China debts because these measure the maximum amount that we estimate that, China, that countries can owe the two Chinese 
policy banks that I mentioned. We say maximum because this are the, com the financing commitments that we've identified from those banks since 2008, since the last global peak before the great financial crisis of 2009. Um, we measure it two different ways, all external debt along the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis, specifically those commitments from these two policy banks over that time, both as a share of country GDP. And again, they're called maximum because it's not public information how much of those debts have been repaid to those policy banks. So this is like a ceiling on how much potentially is owed. We see dashed lines, horizontal and vertical in that scatter plot, indicating the median values for both of those variables. And countries that are above the median in both variables are shown in red here. The second chart shows a smaller group of countries, just those lower income countries that are eligible to participate in the debt service suspension initiative and their payments that are due to China uh, measured two ways. On the horizontal axis as a share of all external payments, regardless of to whom, as Kevin said, about a third is bilateral, a third is about a third globally is multilateral, and about a third is bondholders. And on the vertical axis, we see it as a percentage of just those bilateral payments. And again, countries that score higher than the median in both variables are shown in red here. As you can see, there's significant overlap between these two maps. And geographically, that's where we can focus for the most of uh, the most potential for momentum in debt renegotiations. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Blake, who will talk about specifically biodiversity and climate focused opportunities, as well as give us a walkthrough of our online interactive database so you can explore this data more yourself. Thanks, Rebecca. So to assess differential benefits of debt for nature and debt for climate swaps across countries, we scored countries according to separate climate and biodiversity threats based upon how they compare to the global median of all 102 low and middle income countries that we considered. For climate threats, country level contributions to climate change through their annual carbon emissions and their overall vulnerability to the impacts of climate change uh, through Notre Dame's Climate Vulnerability Index were considered for this analysis. Countries with an annual emissions rate and climate vulnerability index greater than the global medians received the highest climate threat score. Countries exceeding just one of these thresholds received a moderate threat score and countries below these thresholds uh, received a low threat score. For biodiversity threats, each country's annual rate of tree cover loss as a percent of what was available in 2010 and their density of threatened species were considered. Again, those countries with an annual tree cover loss and threatened species density greater than the median thresholds received the highest biodiversity threat score. But the presence of climate and biodiversity threats doesn't necessarily mean that implementing a debt swap will be successful. And this may be because the government has few or vague existing commitments to climate mitigation, or there's simply a lack of ecologically valuable land remaining that can be protected among other potential barriers to success. So to, uh, to account for the opportunity for debt swap success, the costs associated with achieving each country's nationally determined contributions for renewable energy under the Paris Climate Agreement were considered, as well as the proportion of countries remaining intact landscapes that are not currently covered by protected areas. Countries whose NDC commitments as a percent of their GDP exceeded the global median were given a high score for debt for climate opportunity and countries exceeding the global median of unprotected intact land were given a high score for debt for nature opportunity. The overall potential for debt for climate and debt for nature swaps in each country uh, with high Chinese debt exposure was calculated as the sum of the respective scores across these environmental threats and opportunities. This led to our global outlook that identifies several countries under high Chinese debt exposure where debt for nature and debt for climate swaps could be mutually beneficial to curb significant climate and biodiversity threats, including countries like Angola, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, Uganda, and the Solomon Islands. In some cases, different types of debt swaps may be worth prioritizing based on the specific threats facing a country. For example, uh, Senegal, Sudan, and Zimbabwe may, may benefit most from debt for climate swaps to reduce exceptionally high annual carbon emissions and increase investment in building climate resilient communities in these highly uh, climate vulnerable countries. 
Smaller countries like Fiji and Togo could benefit most from debt for nature swaps to protect their high concentration of threatened species and also increase protection of the remaining intact lands for biodiversity. Of course, several other countries might also benefit from participating in debt for climate or debt for nature swaps like Pakistan, Ethiopia, and Cameroon, which users can now explore in more detail in our online interactive. And with that, um, I'd like to introduce everyone to the online interactive China, Debt, Climate and Nature, Opportunities for Financial Stability. The site was developed to enhance users' understanding of the links between Chinese debt exposure, environmental threats and debt swap opportunities outlined in our science article. It's designed for you to explore the relationships between multiple financial and environmental variables that can help identify countries where debt for nature and or debt for climate swaps show promise for maximizing Chinese debt relief and mitigating environmental threats in debtor countries. So to get started, I'll close this welcome box here. Here you can see our global outlook of the potential for debt for climate and debt for nature swaps, equivalent to the previous map I just showed you. You can interact with this map by hovering over a country where you will see the country's profile that summarizes the characteristics defining our assessment of debt swap potential. You can see whether the country was considered under relatively high Chinese debt exposure, including the country's total amount of Chinese finance commitments since 2008, and if the country is included in the DSSI, the total amount of payments that were originally due to China in 2020. You can also see the country's expected potential for debt for nature and debt for climate swaps, including the key environmental characteristics that were used in our assessment. Countries considered under a relatively low Chinese debt exposure in our analysis were not assessed, uh, but you can still view the debt profile for these countries. Here under the explore tab, there are three pages you can visit to explore the data underlying countries, China debt exposure, environmental stress, and opportunities. I'll click on China debt exposure first. On each page, you'll be able to generate maps and graphs of the data included in our analysis. To generate maps, select the variable from the drop-down list. For example, China finance commitments in millions of US dollars. And the map will automatically update. Because these data often contain large outliers, the colors in the map correspond to quartiles based on the data you selected, distinguishing countries according to low, moderately low, moderately high, or high, relative to all 102 countries that we considered. To see the exact value, you can hover over the countries of interest. For example, Brazil is classified as high, with more than $28 billion in China finance commitments since 2008. If you'd like to highlight all of the country countries classified under a specific uh, scale, you can simply collect, uh, select the category in the legend. And then to remove that highlight, you can click this highlight button in the upper right hand corner. To change the map, return back here and select a new variable. Here I'll show the China finance commitments as a percent of GDP. To generate scatter plots, Select the variables that you would like to graph on the X and Y axis from the drop down list, and the graph will also automatically update. So let's plot one of our criteria for identifying countries under high debt exposure. So I'll select China finance commitments as a percent of their GDP for the Y axis, and for the X axis, all external debt as a percentage of their GDP. For each graph, we provide uh, an indicator of the median value for each variable, so you can see where countries stand relative to the rest of the world. You'll see in the legend that countries classified as high China debt exposure are identified in orange, uh, and other countries with relatively low uh, debt exposure are in green. By hovering over a data point, for example, Mongolia here, you can see which country the point corresponds to, as well as the specific values on each axis. You'll also see that highlighting the data point in the graph also automatically highlights it in the map above. This is especially useful when you want to map one thing and graph something else. For example, if I wanted to plot our criteria for identifying DSSI countries under greatest China debt exposure in both the X 
and y axes. I can see that a country like Tajikistan, for example, scores really highly under this DSSI criteria. But in the map above, you can see that it is the lowest quartile when it comes to the percent of its GDP represented by China finance commitments. I can go up to Tajikistan in the map above and see exactly what those commitments were. Um, and you'll see that in uh, once I hover this over in the map, the graph uh, also highlights where Tajikistan uh, is back in the graph. And these features are also found on the other Explore pages that we have. If we head over to the environmental stress page, you'll see new options for you to map and plot. This includes environmental data used to assess climate and nature threats within countries. So climate threats uh, include our annual carbon emissions, as well as climate vulnerability index, and nature threats include uh, annual tree cover loss, as well as threatened species. Again, select the variables that you would like to map. Uh, in some cases, you'll notice that uh, colors deviate from the color palette below. Well, this countries um, like South Sudan here, this indicates that we do not currently have data for this country, in this case, a uh, climate vulnerability score. For people with color vision impairments, you'll be able to tell if no data values exist from the presence of these arrows here on the legend, which you can click to see that there is a null category. If you wanna exclude these countries with null values, simply click on the null category and select exclude. Now this country will be removed from the map for you. As with the previous page, you can plot to different variables uh, and uh, here you can see all of the different environmental threats that you can plot on both the X and Y axes. Here, uh, our third option is this opportunities page. And like the rest of these, you can explore the data used in our analysis where we assess those opportunities to implement debt for nature and debt for climate SOPs and where those might be greatest. In the mapping tool, you can select uh, whether you want to show uh, opportunities for debt for climate or opportunities for debt for nature swaps. In the graphing tool, in the x-axis, you also have those same opportunity variables that you can plot here, but we also allow you to plot those against those environmental threats on the previous page. This way you can go beyond what we did in our analysis to explore any relationships you might be interested in between opportunities and threats. Here on the data page, you can view a description of all the data included in the interactive maps and graphs as well as the original sources of the data. So be sure to check out this page if you wanna know exactly what each variable is estimating and where you can obtain this data for yourself if you'd like to utilize it in your own work. And finally, on the about page, you can learn more about this project, including the methodology from our original uh, analysis, as well as a link to the science article uh, and a blog post that contains more information. You can also uh, click this link here to view a brief guide on how to use this site. This covers much of the content that I have described uh, here, but you can always return to this page in the future to remind yourself of the features available in this interactive. So I hope everyone has enjoyed uh, hearing about our research and exploring this interactive with me. Now I'm going to turn it back to Kevin, where now we are going to hear uh, from our distinguished guests today um, about their experiences uh, uh, in this environment and where to go from here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Blake. Thanks a lot, uh, Rebecca. Um, and for folks that are uh, out there in, in the Zoom space, uh, if you look in the chat, a lot of the studies that have been discussed, the interactive itself, uh, the links to those have all been put in the chat. And um, if you go to our webpage uh, soon after this, we'll have a link to this video so uh, you can get a better idea to, to how to look at this. Um, I want to uh, tr uh, turn this over and ask a few questions of our two distinguished guests and Carlos Larea and Shuang Lu. Let me start with Carlos. Carlos is, is, is from Ecuador. And if you look at uh, the work that, we, that we've done here, unfortunately, Ecuador, show, uh, well, it shows up as climate vulnerable, as biodiversity vulnerable, but also with significant potential. 
And it just so happens that Carlos and a, and a group of his colleagues uh, have been looking into this uh, in parallel to this whole effort in depth um, and have uh, are in the works of putting together a proposal of what an engagement with China on some of these issues might be. Carlos, could you share that with, uh, with the audience? Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, well, as, as we see, Ecuador is a country that uh, has uh, a lot of uh, important traits to be a, a very good uh, example of, uh, of a death for nature swap with China. Ecuador is, uh, is, is affected by a long standard crisis. Uh, we analyzed the uh, high vulnerability for a possible future death moratorium. In, in the case of our country, we have been affected by a long-standing uh, crisis since the collapse of oil, or oil prices. Ecuador is a small South American country that extracts oil from the Amazon with very high environmental impacts. We are proposing a debt for nature swap with China, which uh, will be mostly based on the idea of a drastic the reduction in, in the deforestation rate of the country, we can save uh, 200,000 hectares of rainforests. Uh, and also we can avoid emissions for, for more than uh, 100 million metric tons of uh, carbon dioxide. That, that is essentially the idea. Uh, the, the swap uh, can be done by about uh, four, uh, hundred billion dollars, which represents about six percent of the current uh, debt that Ecuador has with uh, China, uh, and I think it can be a very significant example of uh, the way in which both countries can be benefited from from it. In the short term, Ecuador will be benefited mostly uh, because the debt relief can uh, allow the country a, a, a transitions toward a low emission, sustainable development model, which is essential for Ecuador, given that oil reserves are, are getting very low. And from the Chinese perspective, I think its contribution uh, to both uh, uh, climate change mitigation and also by biodiversity conservation in the most critical region of uh, biodiversity. Uh, the Amazon is actually the largest remaining rainforest in the planet, and it's jeopardized by a very high deforestation rate. You can check it in the database. Actually, the cover, the tree cover the loss in, in the Amazon is very, very high, and it's going on in all the Amazonian countries. That is why with this particular case of Ecuador, which is also one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, we can start with, with the application of this very important thesis that is uh, taking advantage of the current uh, difficult situation of the world economy to begin changing toward a post-COVID world, which will be uh, greener than, than before, uh, more stable both for China, for the rest of the world, and particularly for developing countries, in this case, in Latin America. Very interesting, uh, Dr. Larea. And uh, I noticed that if you want to look at this uh, proposal in Spanish in, in much more depth, uh, it's just been put in the, in the chat. I, from what I understand, it's, uh, uh, it's going to be updated and it will eventually be available in uh, English, Chinese, and in Spanish. I could ask a question of Shuang Lu, and as, and, and as we're having this discussion here, we'll soon open it up uh, to all of you folks out in the audience, and you can go into the Q&A uh, excuse me, bu uh, box and uh, introduce yourself and, and ask a question. And, and the question I, I have for, for Shuang Lu, I've already seen uh, in the chat, uh, David Bolin from UNDP, Yan Wang from the GDP Center and others um, uh, have, a, have a question, which is, what, what might incentives might there be for these kinds of schemes on the China side? And you, you yourself has, uh, have a, a fascinating blog, blog piece outlining uh, some of these kinds of proposals. Uh, if you could sh share your thoughts uh, on, on this general uh, array of schemes and, and what might make China see this as uh, something to invest in and take part in. Oh, it's, 
Thanks, Kevin. Uh, great to uh, join this discussion. Just several thoughts on uh, the drivers that we can, and also arguments we can probably use to engage Chinese holders. The proposal that we have uh, there, it's taking a slightly different angle, looking at not just the climate nature, but the also the other social agendas, particularly on health. This is um, based on the observation that to stakeholders on both ends from the debtor and credit account that health and the other social agendas are probably um, as prioritized as, if not more prioritized than climate in nature. Um, but being able to demonstrate how a debt for uh, health and the other social agendas can actually give us a precedent that can uh, well also engage climate and basically it will be a debt for uh, many SDG targets. So that's what we are proposing and testing out. And uh, that's also based on the observation that uh, on the higher political leadership level, there is a willingness and also a, a, a pledge on um, a more debt relief options. So back in uh, September last year, uh, when uh, President Xi Jinping has announced China's carbon 2016 neutrality target, in his speech, he's also called for the international communities timely and robust measures in that relief. Um, and he also emphasized on um, that these measures shall ensure the implementation of SDGs. So um, with that higher level uh, political uh, commitment, it's a question of how we can translate those uh, commitments and willingness into specific plans that can be conducted on the working level. Um, well, with that, that for uh, climate and the other uh, uh, social and environmental agenda, that's an also opportunity for China to uh, display its global leadership. That will complement China's other environmental commitments, for instance, the carbon neutrality by 2060, and burnish China's image as a climate champion. But that's an argument that we can use uh, actually on all levels of stakeholders we want to engage on that really uh, discussion. Uh, I also want to uh, share that the uh, debt swap is actually an option for China um, to, and also the stakeholders in China to uh, kind of well, well, it's because we have seen many research seeing that that uh, negotiation, renegotiation and distress, it's very common among the debt that China has on, in those countries. And uh, that swap is actually offered an option uh, in those renegotiations and can extend the plan that both sides can uh, have to uh, uh, address those uh, that distress. And last but not least, uh, I also want to share uh, that the current uh, Paris Club principles are very much implemented and used by the Chinese uh, creditors in the debt. However, China is not part of the Paris Club uh, member. And also um, because of the, the status of the OECD countries, China is unlikely uh, in the near future to join Paris Club. But with the debt swap option, is that possible that can happen on a more neutral international platform or forum that China and many other emerging countries who are not currently part of the Paris Club can be the founding members and the more principles can be discussed and lay out on that platform instead of being limited to the Paris Club members and the other OECD countries. And the pause here, Kevin, I'm happy to share more thoughts. Thanks so much. Uh, do, do any of you uh, in, on the panel uh, have a, a question or a comment uh, for each other before I start? Um, before I start going into some that are in the Q&A box. And for those of you who are, who are out there in the audience, you can go into the Q&A box and, and write in a, a question. Um, uh, Becky, you, you, have your, you have your hand up. Yes, I have a question for our distinguished guests. I'm so happy that you're able to be with us this morning. Uh, one of the challenges that we face in considering these opportunities and these challenges is how to get finance folks and biodiversity conservation or climate change mitigation folks to talk together, be it in government ministries, environment ministries and finance ministries, or in civil society groups or in the general public. But both of you have made a career out of success in that particular arena. And I think we all have a lot to learn 
from your experiences, specifically in bridging that gap to get momentum going so that finance ministry folks or folks uh, focused on uh, finance concerns and civil society or the general public can understand the importance of long-term sustainable development goals and vice versa, that um, folks uh, who focus professionally on conservation and climate change mitigation can understand the economic tools through which they can pursue their goals. I'm wondering if either of you have wisdom to share about bridging those gaps and getting progress started in communication and collaboration. Thank you. Well, in the specific case of Ecuador, I think the country has a, a very difficult future in trying to reach sustainable development goals within the current framework of an extractivist economy based on oil. I think the way in the future uh, towards uh, uh, achieving a part in a participatory way to, with respect to nature, the sustainable development goals is uh, to try to define a low emission development platform. And I think this opportunity for reducing deforestation is an essential component of this future for the country. I think the most important natural uh, uh, base of, uh, for Ecuador uh, uh, for the future is it, uh, uh, biodiversity and cultural diversity. And so uh, by reducing the forestation in a, passive, in a very participatory way, with the participation of uh, local governments, uh, civil society, indigenous groups, particularly in the Amazon basin, I think we are creating opportunities for the future. Uh, we, we have a, a, actually a very, very interesting experience that Brazil has between 2005 and 2012 in reducing deforestation by 83% uh, during the Lula administration with the support of Norwegian and Germany funds. I think we have a model and we can uh, try to follow this experience, which has been the most successful in the history of the Amazonian basin in reducing deforestation. Uh, so I think this proposal is both feasible and can lead uh, to a sustainable and participatory development model for Ecuador in the future. Yeah, uh, Rebecca, I, I wish I have a, yeah. Perfect answer to your question, <laughs> but it, it is a very uh, complicated and challenging area. I think I just want to po propose one idea we can test is that what the counterparts of the China uh, of China and the stakeholders can also do to bridge discussions. And as Kevin has pointed out, China is the largest bilateral uh, creditor, which all brought together that group accounts for about one third of uh, the total debt level. Um, for for instance, the international financing institutions who account for about one third for World Bank, IMF, and many other uh, MDBs, it seems that there is increasing interest in bridging the discussion on that of financing issues versus the environmental issues within those organizations. And it's very unlikely that China will take on much more ambitious debt relief actions on its own. And so if there will be more international dialogues and collaboration discussions, can we work with a, um, other international financing institutions um, to push forward for the idea and maybe to set the agenda at the intersection of the finance and environmental issues so that we can engage the Chinese uh, stakeholders who are, to be honest, the, the concept is not that um, well, they're not that familiar with the concept yet. And so with the agenda and uh, some proposal from the other stakeholders, uh, uh, particularly in uh, the international financing institutions, whether we can socialize it with the Chinese uh, parts later on. Thanks, folks. Uh, should I move to the, uh, the Q&A that I have here in the box or does uh, Shuang Lu or Carlos have any comments or questions for Blake, Rebecca, or myself? We've got a, we've got a, a big cluster of questions here, uh, really, really good ones. Um, I'll start with, with uh, I've tried to cluster them on, on specific issues. So here's one from, uh, from Simon Zadek. Uh, Simon's directing something called Finance for Biodiversity Initiative. It's www 
uh, F4B slash initiative dot net. These folks are advancing uh, complementary work to what we're doing, focused on how to scale up nature and climate linked sovereign debt, uh, so that we do not so do, so we do not get uh, half a dozen deals done now and then back uh, and and get small scale developments. Um, this is in in very much consistent with our with the GDP Center's larger proposal with others on the debt relief for a green recovery. He says that China has an opportunity to advance the scale of its RMB denominated bonds in international markets by advancing such debt instruments and deals much as it did in 2016 with green bonds and their proposals for a sovereign debt facility to enable these deals to scale up. Um, I guess, and there's another question by uh, John L. Kobe, which is similar. And uh, Blake and Rebecca in their slides, they, they were very clear to say in our paper, in this conversation here, we're not limiting this only to the old school uh, debt for nature swaps. If those can happen, that's great. But there's a host of possibilities and instruments, uh, one of which we mentioned are uh, nature performance bonds. So I guess one question for the group uh, is what since China was such a leader on green bonds, the market is, is still fledgling, but it's quite strong. Uh, to what extent might there be a, uh, a potential for nature or climate performance bonds on the, on the Chinese end? And could they be linked to these kinds of negotiations? I think that clusters a couple of the questions together. We have a clarification question from Scott Vaughn from the China Council on International Cooperation on Environment Development. He just asked, did I understand from Ms. Liu's final comment that there could be a new group created to complement the Paris Club comprised of China and other developing country lenders? It was just a clarification question. Um, there is a question from Divya Narain from, uh, from Queensland, uh, University of Queensland. Her question is, China is known to collateralize its debt with natural resources. And I think that's the case in the Ecuadorian case. Uh, there have been reports in the past of countries having to service debt with oil like Ecuador or even elephants uh, in Zimbabwe. What are your recommendations for natural resource linked loans as these have direct implications for biodiversity and climate change in these debt distressed countries? with them having to dig deeper into their ecosystems to extract resources. So that's a second question. Just trying to uh, cluster in um, a bunch here. Here's another one from Yunnan Chen. Uh, Yunnan uh, is a former fellow here from the GDP Center and is now a researcher on development finance at the Overseas Development Institute in the UK. She says, there seems to be a win-win opportunity through debt and climate swaps and creating potential for developing countries to achieve their NDCs through expanding renewables investment and for China to export some of its renewable energy technology. We haven't seen this so far based on some of the data that's out there, including ROs at BU uh, in China's official financing. What are the bottlenecks to this? And is there a feasible way to link these policy goals? There's a whole bunch of questions here, but that can certainly get us. Let me just do one more from David Boland uh, in uh, Lao PDR from UNDP. Uh, he says, thanks for an interesting presentation and uh, that the work, uh, I think this is uh, for the science paper authors, the work describes the significant potential for Chinese debt relief to impact biodiversity and climate outcomes. Can you offer some perspectives on the, on, of the tangible benefits and incentives that may convince different Chinese actors to actually provide such relief? So why don't we go in the reverse order of what we started. We start with uh, 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 Shuang Lu and Dr. Larea, and then the BU GDP team. And if we have a chance, we'll uh, we'll go back into the Q and A box for another round of Q questions. We we only have 11 minutes uh, left, so please try to keep your answers uh, short, short and sharp. Yeah, I guess I, I can pick up two questions trying to uh, answer. On the clarification question, uh, yes, we're, we're, we're suggesting if we can test out uh, another new new platform in addition to Paris uh, Club. And there was a precedent, for instance, OECD's export credit uh, working group that was uh, not, China was not part of that group. A couple of years ago, there was a new international working group on export credit uh, 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 discussion 
which engages China and many other uh, engage, emerging countries. That's uh, probably an idea that we can explore. And um, uh, I think Yunnan's question on China's RE in, uh, investment uh, I think uh, in addition to uh, um, official uh, uh, like Exken and CDB's data, we're also uh, looking at and jointly with Kevin's team and two other uh, two uh, other NGOs led commercial banks investment uh, overseas in particularly in power sector. And we have seen actually over the past couple of years how the trend seems more promising right. that more uh, investment compared to before is flowing into our uh, renewable energy uh, sectors in China's overseas investment. Several of the bottlenecks we have noticed may include um, that the Chinese investors are still not 100% familiar with the local uh, legal conditions, uh, for instance, on the land acquisition uh, to uh, further expand the renewable energy investment. And also uh, that how to engage local communities to better enable those projects. We have also heard the comments from the Chinese investors. That's the area they also want to actually further improve in the future. But we have seen that how the Chinese investors are actually revisiting their investment strategy on power sector. Seeing coal investment are getting a lot less competitive than it was before. And we have seen uh, some signals from the key Chinese investors on renewable energy is probably where they want to focus and prioritize on in the coming future. And this is also partly because of the debt uh, dist uh, distress we're talking about today, um, that larger projects uh, under the situation are considered as riskier than smaller ones. So in power sector, the renewable energy projects are going to be more appealing to Chinese investors uh, in the near future. Kevin. Thank you, uh, Dr. Thank you. Linnea. Yes, thank you. I would like only to, to refer briefly to, to the problem of oil presence in the case specific of Ecuador. Uh, they are very, very uh, bad, both for the environment, for climate change, or for economic sustainability of the country. Uh, as Ecuador, uh, as, as, as Venezuela, our country is highly dependent on oil exports. Uh, having credits that have to be paid with oil is, is a way in which we deepen extractivist problems. We are uh, far from uh, fulfilling the, the, the goals of the Paris Agreement because we are promoting the expansion of oil activity. And at the same time, we are precipitating a deeper economic crisis. In, Ecuador. in the specific case of our country, most of oil uh, that has to be extracted in the next two years is already committed to paying uh, the foreign debt with China in, in this way of uh, um, pre-oil present. And, and the country is trying to negotiate a new one. That is why we strongly oppose this, this procedure because uh, it is a kind of a destabilizing mechanism both environmentally and economically for the country and for the world. Thank you. Becky and Blake. I'd be happy to chop in on the question about RMB denominated green bonds. Um, as we said in our presentation, there's a myriad of instruments through which this type of um, problem solving can happen. And uh, as, as Shuang Liu said, China is not 100% familiar yet with this history that's developed in, in Western countries and with Western debtors and Western borrowers uh, regarding debt for nature and debt for climate swaps. But China has been a long-term pursuer of the internationalization of its currency, trying to promote the use of its currency in bond markets around the world, and has also been a leader in the development of green bonds. And so RMB denominated green bonds really do, I think, have the potential to be an important element in this toolbox because there's already an understanding within Chinese policymaker, among Chinese policymakers, of the importance of pursuing those missions. Um, and so absolutely, we, we see this as a whole host of, of potential mechanisms, um, some of which are going to be more attractive in some situations and others are going to be more attractive in other situations. And I'm so glad you brought up that possibility. Um, and, and briefly to uh, expand upon 
Yunan's question about natural resource-based and collateralized debt, um, that has in fact been a part of policy banks, Chinese policy banks, a practice in the past. And in fact, we hope that this kind of mechanism can essentially flip the script and say, what if instead of further tying you to a natural resource extraction-based economy, which as Professor Herrera says, is neither sustainable environmentally or economically because it ties you to a very volatile commodity price booms and busts. Um, what if it was tied to investing in your long-term sustainable development assets, which are your biodiversity and your cultural diversity? Um, we hope to essentially flip the script or empower developing countries to do so in their own development narratives. Thank you. Quick thoughts or reactions, Blake? Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll comment just briefly um, on the question of uh, uh, how do we actually build an attractive business case um, for, the, for these types of mechanisms? And I think one of the important things to realize is um, the flexibility with these sort of debt swap models to really be able to apply to a large variety of different nature-based solutions uh, to climate change. And a lot of research um, is now being done to actually try to uh, quantify the tangible financial benefits of these different uh, and diverse nature-based solutions. Um, and I think that's going to be really important whenever we think about how do we actually uh, get people to sign on to these things. Uh, and, and of course, the, debt, the traditional debt swap mechanism, uh, at least for, for nature swaps, of area-based conservation uh, is certainly one sort of type of approach. Uh, but the, the diversity is really endless, whether it's from um, ecological engineering or uh, climate adaptation services, green infrastructure, uh, integrated coastal or water resource management, all of these different types of things um, uh, can fit into this debt swap uh, renegotiation model and also deliver significant economic returns from those ecosystem services that they provide. Um, so I, th I know uh, researchers around the world are, are jumping on this opportunity to try to quantify um, these values and, and make sure that we uh, are able to incentivize um, all those different types of creditors that may be out there looking to see what those long-term financial gains are compared to the short, relatively short-term gains uh, of comparative gray infrastructure. Thanks, Blake. Uh, we're running out of time here. I just want to reiterate what I said in the beginning that we want to put this in its larger context. In no way is the GDP Center, and I think our two uh, our two colleagues who who have joined us here are is this uh, is today's conversation what we see as the only solution to the global debt is global debt problems. Um, but we really wanted to think that it should uh, argue that it should be part of it. Um, we over and over say that it's very important for a massive new allocation of special drawing rights, massive new firepower uh, from the IMF and development finance, and that a debt relief initiative should be multilateral and fundamentally linked to the kinds of outcomes that we are advocating for here today. We do a lot of research as do our two guests that we have here today on China's overseas. China has been a leader on debt relief uh, under the G20 in the COVID era. And uh, we've identified some potential opportunities on where such things, such as nature performance bonds, traditional swaps, uh, it's, and, and just straight on conservation investments. Uh, China is said to be considering a biodiversity fund as part of its uh, unveiling of the, it hosts the Convention on Biological Diversity this year. Uh, hopefully we've identified some places where you could maximize both climate and biodiversity efforts in that. Nor are we saying that only China should be part of such, such schemes. Again, this should be a multi, to get the maximum amount of scale, this should be a multilateral effort that engages the international financial institutions, private bondholders, and bilateral bilateral creditors. Um, we are just focusing on China today. The world needs a multilateral whatever it takes, and we hope that today we put uh, another instrument and set of conversations to add to that what of whatever it takes spirit uh, that needs to needs to be engaged on in a, in, a, in an urgent manner. And I should say.
that we don't hope we hope that today is is the beginning of a conversation about a lot of these uh, com uh, a lot of these things. Simon Zadak, who uh, asked a question earlier at at uh, F four, and uh, and others around the world, IIED. I think Paul Steele is on this call. There's been a lot of conversations in this space, um, and we hope that uh, hope we've been able to move the needle a little bit. But uh, we really need a whatever it takes kind of. Uh, framework to be able to move forward into 2021 with an eye on the ball of this most important decade, uh, certainly the 20th, 21st century so far. I'm sorry to all of you folks out there and, and as part participants that we didn't get to all of your questions. Uh, a video of today's presentation will be on the GDP webpage with a short blog summary of what happened. Um, and we'll make sure that we get that out on social media. Uh, please uh, sign up for GDP Center events. If you go to our webpage, it's out here on the on the chat. Uh, we'll be having a number of conversations like this and on on this topic and a number of topics uh, throughout the throughout 2021. So happy New Year, everyone, and look forward to uh, working with all of you uh, to do whatever it takes to attack this virus, protect the vulnerable, and mount a green recovery. Thanks so much.